Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 293 of Real Blend, a podcast that has already broken all of its New Year's Eve resolutions. I'm really sorry to report. My name is Sean O'Connell, and on this week's show, Jake Johnson is going to join us to talk about his new film, Self-Reliance, which is available on Hulu and is absolutely worth checking out. We're going to review that in a little bit. Jake was also a terrific conversation. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, let me introduce our own Jake. Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, handsome. How are you, sir? There's nothing like being introduced as the second most talented Jake we have on the show. I'm, I'm already the least talented person on the show. Now I have to be the least <laughs> talented Jake on the show. He was so charming, though. He was, he was really charming and his movie's terrific. And he's a Chicago guy. So Chicago guy. Yeah, maybe yeah. on the on the interview, Chirons, you can do Jake number one and put Johnson as number one and then Jake number yeah. two. Clearly. That's a good idea. Well, I'll, just, I'll put, just the other one. I'll put, yeah, I'll put Jake Johnson and then the I'll other put one. other Jake. <laughs> and <laughs> guest. And <laughs> well, and for someone there where there's multiple Kevin McCarthy's, yeah. uh, we, have, <laughs> yeah. we have Kevin McCarthy yeah. of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. joining us. Hello, Kev. How are you? Hello, Sean, Jacob, Gabriel. Uh, great to be back. And uh, I'm very excited for people to hear this Jake Johnson interview. This was th I haven't laughed that much in an interview that we've done probably since the Tom Hanks one for Otto and yeah. then the, the Flanagan one for Dr. Sleep. We, we ben, were rolling. Ben Schwartz is a good laugh. Too. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's yeah. A big one. I, I think you guys sleep on. Um, oh, God. What was the interview early in Real Blend that we had to edit because he went so deep into his porn career? Oh, Son <laughs> Sonnenfeld. Yeah. Oh, Barry, Barry Sonnenfeld. Barry Sonnenfeld. Oh, yeah. my God. That was a good yeah. one. Yeah. For context, he used to, he was a cinematographer for. I don't think adult we need context. Films. I don't think we need context. I, I better without context. We're just going to let them infer. We're going to let them infer. Know, Ridley, Ridley. If you guys uh, remember, we saying, cut the context. So let's not, let's not reintroduce yeah. the context. <laughs> Ridley saying he wasn't impressed with, uh, with, with Chris Nolan liking him, I think still is one of the That's biggest great. laughs I've had in 2020. <laughs> yeah. But between Ridley Scott and Peloton one. trainers, no one likes Christopher Nolan these days. Holy cow. That story blew up. <laughs> We're the last ones, everywhere. apparently is one of my favorite stories <laughs> and it's it, it I might feel be bad for her I feel really bad for her actually. why that was an, that, because I don't like feel bad. None, none of us in all the times that like any of us have shit on a movie none of us have ever really been presented with the idea of the person that you who the person whose film you shit on I mean she was being recorded <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so are we, but like if, if, yeah. if someone, you know, if, if Sean, you know, if Zack Snyder heard you, you, you know, shit on Rebel Moon, isn't there a part of you that would be like, oh, that, that sucks. But in, in this it instance, is what we sign up for. I, I'm yeah, not a Peloton is. person, so I don't know how Peloton operates normally. I don't know how interactive the the um, the hosts are, but it was partic it's it was particularly felt personal it just felt like she was so angry about the film it was an odd and not dick. liking it um yeah. but i mean but then she did she did come out and did say she did see oppenheimer twice and <laughs> she liked it um so it, th this is such a great story it is great well listen hello if you're watching us on youtube thank you for joining us here uh on friday mornings or whenever you get around to checking us out on the youtube channel while you're here please hit subscribe Turn on your notifications, give us a like, head to the comments down below, let us know where you're listening in from. We get some love from all over the globe uh, when the show starts to turn off. <laughs> Thank you, Jake, for doing your Price is Right model. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, go to youtube.com backslash Real Blend Podcast if you haven't yet checked out the YouTube channel. Of course, we're available all the different places you get your podcast needs met. And if you would like to sign up for Real Blend Premium, we will get you an ad free version of the podcast and a newsletter from me. And by the time you guys are listening to this, that newsletter should be sitting in your inbox. Um, so all the incentives to sign up for Real Blend Premium. We're back at it for 2024. As mentioned, uh, we did our most anticipated of the year and now we're starting to get back into interviews. Um, so as we said, Jake Johnson uh, is you guys know him from obviously he was a new girl for years. He did a, a couple different movies with Joe Swanberg. Uh, Drinking Buddies was my one of my favorite ones that they did together of which anna kendrick was in that movie as well too so they have a little bit of history there uh, and now jake johnson's directing a movie called self-reliance of course he's peter parker in the in the spider-verse films as well too i shouldn't overlook that uh he has a movie called self-reliance it's coming out to hulu uh, i want everybody to sort of go into self-reliance knowing it uh as little about it as possible um we will review it on the other end um and, but i will note that in the jake johnson interview 
towards the very end, and we do put plenty of warnings in the conversation of when we're going to discuss, we do get into the conversation of the ending. Um, and even at that, his answer is a little bit uh, protective of ultimately what's going on. So if you want to listen to it, I think that you're safe. But if you would like to stop before you get to that point, go watch the movie. It's available on Hulu uh, and then come on back and finish it. But in the meantime, we're going to get uh, to our interview with Jake Johnson talking about self-reliance and his career and all of his decisions. And then we will review the film on the other side. So we'll see you then. The, the four minute, uh, the four minute game drives me bananas. It's awful. Yeah. I mean, we don't get the same thing. But I also don't understand why in this day and age we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. Because with clips, everybody sees everything. So I'm sitting across and in the four minutes, you have to ask a certain question. But I'll go, I know you know the answer and I know I've answered it. But then if I answer it as a joke, I'm now being disrespectful to your time. So I'm right. like, I don't know how to win here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, also, it's like, true. Trust me, we, it's yeah, we true. have the same concerns. I know it. It's like we do this same dance and I'm like, I've talked to the publicist about it. I'm like, who's it for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's true. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll ask you a few questions you haven't heard yet yeah, at this point. Of course. So, uh, starting with this one, I want to know who would have to be in a limousine to get you, Jake Johnson, mm -hmm. to get in it and then participate in the game. You know, honestly, the truth is, and I was thinking about this a lot when I was writing it, it's me now with two kids no one <laughs> it would have to be my children or my wife and the only person who would get me in there if i was taking a nice walk by myself my wife would have to say get your fat ass in this limo you have not been helping enough <laughs> otherwise i'm enjoying a quiet wife with like a little podcast in or some music uh, but pre-kids um when you know before i had kids a lot of people could have pulled me in that limo Mm -hmm. I was in my 20s. I was somebody always looking for something exciting. You know, in terms of storytelling, it always becomes the rut and, you know, stuck in your life because you need to uh, put a story in a way that becomes more universal. And honestly, it's, it's easy when you're trying to get it made. They need a, a trailer moment. But in my life, I never felt like I was in a, a, a rut or a loser. I was just looking for something really exciting. Mm. And something to happen that felt extraordinary that made a Wednesday feel better. <laughs> and so uh, back then, I would say anybody, if any cast member from Cheers, if any any <laughs> member of any TV show that I grew up watching said like, hi, I'm Polly from Cheers. Remember, I was a reoccurring guest star. You want to I'm jumping in the limo. <laughs> and first, don't even open the door, Polly. I'm head first in. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. Andy Samberg would probably get me into a limo because I, I, I mean, I well, also what's funny about Andy Samberg and the limo is and lo, the Lonely Island, obviously a part of this production. But like I, pop star has one of my favorite limo scenes in the history of movies. Like with that, that scene, yeah. you know, what I'm talking about Jake. If you see no, it, you I, I've seen it, pop. I don't remember the limo. There's a scene with him and Akiva Schaefer and Yorma in the limo. Just go ahead and watch it. I'm not even going to explain okay. it because it's so funny. Oh, um, yeah. I, I do want to bring up the tone of your film because I think tone is such a fascinating thing when you're you're playing with aspects here that I also I would argue there's horror aspects to it there's totally. intensity to it and then you slice it with comedy um but I think the way in my opinion the reason why all that works outside of performances and script and direction is your score your score is Agreed. Dan's yes. score is ridiculously great. And there's something yeah. about that like dissonant violin sound and the, yep. the repetitive drum nature of the score yep. that just kind of like moves the film in a way. And I wanted to ask you totally. as a filmmaker, when you have a script and you have the story and you have the tone mm -hmm. of it, how you incorporate narratively that, that, that score to kind of fit what you're looking for. Great question. Yeah. So score was everything to this movie. So in terms of the uh, tone really fast, uh, so I honestly, I wanted to mix all those together because I'm 45 years old. I don't know how many movies I'm going to direct, if ever again. Uh, I had tried to get things made for so many years and got so many no's that I had gotten very comfortable in my role in Hollywood, and I still am in it. So I know like the next couple moves are not going to be directing another movie. And so when all of a sudden I started getting momentum about directing something, I didn't want to just make one tone because I don't know if I'll ever do it again. So I'm like, I was, it was like, man, if yeah. you got one shot, even if you can't land every plane, because it's hard to land all these. I was like, 
I'm not looking to make a movie like it would be nice if I could land them all, but I wanted to be ambitious and I wanted every scene to have something where I'm like, I don't know how to direct that yet. So even like the mm -hmm. action, that stuff with like Boban, the, when he's like beating me up on the side, you know, we had our stunt coordinators and at a certain point I had to say to our DP where he's like, well, how do you want to shoot this? And I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I want it to look really good and scary. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in terms of score, uh, that was the work Dan Romer does in it is exceptional. Um, it's but it, it was one of the hardest parts of it because we had to really grind because it wasn't one of those things where you just throw it in. Like it started, I had I heard a musician called Moondog, who's this like wild composer out of New York who just does like really crazy stuff. And I thought like, well, there's something there. And then I was with my family in Hawaii and there was some like, you know, terrible Disney show with the kids were at where they were like talking about the history of the island and all the lights went off. And I thought like, I hate this. And then this <laughs> drumming started and like fire was shooting off. And I was literally texting Dan Romer and I was like, I'm going to record this. There's something to this. Mm. And then he decided those are really rich sounding drums, but they're too rich. So he actually did all the drumming off of like buckets he got at Home Depot because oh, he's wow. like, you want this rich bass drumming tribal mm. sound, but your movie is about like garbage and, you know, running around on the streets of LA. We don't have, those aren't the sounds of rich drumming. Those are the sounds of like hollow drums. So mm. he had like a lot of that sound, the, the high beat, the t -t 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 -t. that's literally mm. on just a two by four with uh, sticks. <laughs> Oh my what? God. That's yeah, awesome. So like, I really wish people could like the experience for me sitting in Dan's biz basement or his studio basement, as he was building these sounds, I was like, Jake, we were talking before about the documentary. I'm like the documentary of that. It's fascinating. He would go like, mm. what do you mean? And I'd be like, something. he would go, I think I get it. Let me try something. Just pick up stuff on a wall and like, bang, bang, bang. And I'm like, you're there, mm. man. So, <laughs> but I, for me, the score is the movie. It's not too far off from Daniel Pemberton and the work yeah, that Daniel yeah, Pemberton's yeah. doing oh in God. the Spider-Verse movies. Yeah. <laughs> putting, a, putting a duck in there and stuff like that. Before we get to, to Jake, Jake's question, I do want to point out, um, in terms of tone, there's a yeah. scene in particular that I felt that almost encompasses the whole tone of the film. It's the Mario scene. Right. Because it's like the comedy and the Koopa, the, all that, the, everything in that dialogue. But then when he walks backwards... Yes. That was like Get Out, Jordan Peele. Yeah, like, yeah, it reminded me of like, It Follows. scared yeah. me. Yeah, like, it yes. was terrifying, Agreed, man. agreed. So just in terms of the main reason that I wanted to direct in terms of when I, because I didn't come into this game wanting to be a director. I wanted to be a writer and an actor, and I wanted to tell stories. So directing has kind of jumped out recently in terms of this, but that was never the dream. The technical mm. side of directing, which is like the great directors have, I don't have. And there's a level of being a geek with directing that you kind of have to be because mm -hmm. you have to love all that nitty gritty. My brain doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So, but what the reason I really wanted to direct is that I love when people are allowed to be really good and not ask for permission. Mm -hmm. And if I were a basketball coach, if I was a, a coach of a team, I would want to be a player's coach. And you only win if your players are like kicking ass and doing their mm -hmm. thing. And that yeah. actor came in and had asked a lot of questions. And finally I said, like, I think you know what it is. And that moment where he walks backwards, he improvised it. He oh, didn't wow. Ask. I know. That Dude, was not, that was so scary. I know it was so not scary. in the script. Uh it was supposed to be he walks down the hall, he turns, and then just walks back. And I thought, you know, directing wise, we would probably be on a two shot of us with kind of mm -hmm. like me doing big scared face and Anna Kendrick kind of looking scared. And I thought the walk back would get us a laugh. And then her okay. probably going like, no, no, no. And me being like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And I thought that was going to be the take. And then he starts walking backwards and the whole vibe of set changed. Oh. And after that, we all kind of stopped. And I realized like, yeah, this is a different scene than I imagined. And you're dead, right? Let's just keep going. No, That's no, awesome. do it again. Whatever you think. And then he did another one where like he gets really close and the end of the scene is in this really yeah. tight two shot. Well, we then changed coverages to make sure we had that because of what he was doing. So the DP wow. was like, 
uh, watch playback. This shit looks way better than we kind of thought it was going to. So that's it's like the, stomach that, turning. It's yes. terrifying when he and backs up. Great. I don't know why. That stuff was. was the kind of highlight of directing when somebody else would do something as opposed to all of us saying to somebody else, can we do that again? And the director goes, no, don't walk backwards. And I'm thinking like, just let him go. He's stealing the movie right here. It's good. Let him win. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I don't mean to Not. do like a, a name dropping, but we. But Tom Hanks was on the show one time. And one of my favorite quotes anyone's ever said on this show is, we're just making this shit up. He's talking yes, about like how sometimes things on, on a set, like it, whoever has the best idea wins. Yeah, it doesn't no, matter who it is. That's because, so the reason uh, Tom Hanks is Tom Hanks, I think is partly because he has that theory. The amount of times I've been on the set and somebody tries to control what we're all making up mm. and you go like, it reminds me of like, if you ever had like, you went to a friend's house when you were younger and you realized you're not going to stay friends with them because you're like playing action figures. And then you go like, huh, and they go, that's not what that guy does. Mm. Yeah. And you're like, of course yeah. it is, motherfucker. <laughs> what you do is what you do. I'm like, my dude does backflips. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> He can only move forward. And you're like, you just made up these arbitrary rules and you're making it yeah. so lame. Dude, we're three guys who cover like comic book fandom. We all know all about being told by, by fanboys. That's not what that yes. character does. Yeah. It's like, yeah. these are fictional but, characters. And, and we're also, we're just goofing around. And if you don't yeah, like yeah. it, don't yeah. use it in the, in the, when you edit it. And so a lot of times on set, the reason I wanted to direct is, I've been on TV where you're with somebody, Rob Riggle comes on New Girl, and he's improvising in a way where we're all cry laughing after a take. Yeah. Yeah. And it finishes, and I'll go like, man, I've been here 14 hours a day, five days a week. That's the hardest I've laughed in two months. Then the mm. director comes in and goes like, very funny, very funny. But let's go back to where we were. <sighs> and you go, for who? <laughs> the writer's here with tears on their face. Yeah, and you yeah. go like, like, how about let's exhaust this moment. And then yeah. for safety, if you want to pick up one thing, but you also have it all. Mm. And so cool. that to me is a big part. I wanted to see what it was like to not have anybody ever say no, if somebody's mm. killing it with an idea. Mm. Well, that, well, that might be the, the answer to my next question, because obviously this is your, your feature directorial debut, but you directed an episode of Mean Girls, or not Mean Girls, of, uh, I, I, was, I saw Mean Girls last yes. night. New Girl. I, I yeah. swear to God, I, didn't make, I saw Mean Girls last night. Uh, New Girl. Not, I'm not offended, Jake. <laughs> um, so I, I'm sort of curious what <laughs> mistakes you were able to get out of the way directing that episode of New Girl mm -hmm. that you're glad that you already knew coming yeah. into this film. Well, I did that. I also did a, like, a, I've done some commercials too. So I've had some experience back there. Uh, and then with all the Swanberg movies uh, that we've done in Chicago, the win it alls, the drinking buddies uh, and the um, um, digging for fire. He really allows me to kind of like study the process of directing. And a lot of on TV, even when I wasn't directing, you're just kind of studying what directors are doing. So there was just, a, there was a lot. And really the big thing was, was not stopping other people, even if their vision's a little different than mine. Like for example, the production designer for this movie, visually, I like one thing. I like everything, a certain kind of dark tone. I like it to be, you know, almost look like Yosemite from the late seventies. If it's not that, I don't really like the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And she would say like, every set that you're pitching me is the same. So like the family's house in this movie was all going to be wood paneled wood uh, walls with dark carpet, those old Chicago couches that when you would like sit on them at a friend's house or a cousin's house, you'd be like, this is disgusting. <laughs> like I can literally smell your grandma's cigarette smoke in the fabric. <laughs> How many dogs have died on this couch? <laughs> and, and you know, she would push and say like, it can't all be the same. And so the thing that I learned was it's really nice to not always win and to let somebody else go. And then when I would see what she came up with and really when I was in post, I'd be like, oh, I'm so glad like this set is lighter. I'm so glad mm -hmm. like this doesn't have it's not one dark tone, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So the big thing that I learned was I don't think I think certain directors, a guy like Jordan Peele, who's obviously a genius, whatever he says goes, you know, mm -hmm. Greta Gerwig, if she's got like, she can kind of just take over. But then there's a whole other tier of director that I'm in. And that is, you're the manager of the target. Let everybody do their job too. <laughs> My wife loved <laughs> um, Natalie, Natalie's front porch. When you oh, guys had your conference. Yeah, she goes, yeah, what a gorgeous front porch that is. And I was like, <laughs> I was like what a <laughs> random comment that was from you. <laughs> is that, is that, 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 that
Anna comes out from the bushes and yeah, like yeah, says, yeah, hey, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Well, to that end, um, Jake, I think that you <laughs> perform so well when you have the right person to bounce off of. Uh, and so I want you to just it. sing the praises of um, this film's secret weapon, which is Biff Mr. Whiff. Biff Whiff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so God damn, he's hysterical. Yeah. Uh, he's Brilliant. the best. So Biff Whiff to me was um, uh, he's the best part of the movie. Uh, he was my favorite part of directing the movie. He was uh, my, the rap gift that I got. Everybody was just a photo of his face. <laughs> Uh, uh, he, he, you know, like, you know, they always say, like, don't pick favorites. Well, it was yeah. very clear. I, I picked favorites. <laughs> I'd be like, it's nice having everybody here. Well, you guys are living in Biff Whiff's world. Yeah. <laughs> including me. I'd be like, I would have a scene in my single and I'd be looking at the operator being like, when do we turn around? And I'm like, I know Biff soon. Shut up. Um, but the reason I think he kills it so hard is that he to me is the tone of the movie so when you're like for me a lot of times when i'm trying to figure out like what we're doing here and even as an actor i'm like what is it that we're what is the bit here what is this tone like what is this one biff was it so i could always check in with him and then wherever he was kind of at like my only note to him was never try to be funny and don't mm. push but mm. like for me like in the intervention scene mm. the stuff he's doing behind my character <laughs> while I'm talking in those two shots is probably the hardest the editor and I laughed where they would say to me, I'd be like, what is this? And they'd be like, I'd be like, you think I have a drug problem? And he would crack up. <laughs> No one directed him to laugh there. <laughs> and then like there'd be moments where like, you know, we're sitting there and then when we're sitting there, he offers me a chip. Well, that was not directed. I mean, it, we, we shot everything, you know, I, the way that I love to act and the way that I love to direct is I hate little pickups. I hate them. Every mm. scene should be start to finish as written. Like if you improvise, improvise, but it's all start to finish. So if you're going to improvise, which I'm open to, you're not a stand-up comedian. So don't improvise a joke and then go like, what'd you guys think? Improvise that joke and then find your way to the next person's line because you need to help transition them back in because we need to finish the scene. Mm. So I, I hate pickups. I hate starting in the middle. Start in the beginning. Do the whole scene. Build it out. If somebody forgets their line, remind them fast, but stay in it so that it feels like it's alive. Mm. And in the middle of it, the family on our coverage with Biff and I, they're killing me. You know, mm -hmm. and the actors are good, you know, Nancy and Mary and Emily and Daryl, they're coming hard at me and really making it seem like Tommy's wrong. Yeah. And I always played it like Tommy's right. Yeah. And I told them, play it however you want. So like Emily Hampshire's vibe was like, it's funny. Uh, one of the sisters, Mary Holland's vibe was, I'm worried about my brother. And the mom was, I'm really scared. So right. while we're shooting it, it feels like a little weird drama. And... Mm -hmm. They're telling me how like sad this is and I've done it before. And then all of a sudden this fucking dude offers me a plate of chips. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, in the moment as Jake, I wanted to say wrong time in my king, like put those chips down. <laughs> but I can't quit the game. Like I, in my head, I thought I was taken out and I thought like, no, Biff wrong and i thought like next take i'll just remind you like don't do that in the middle of this moment but in the moment you gotta live in it so i think i just said like no thank you then as i'm doing it i was thinking like he's biting these chips so loud it's screwing up audio and then when we watched it we we're like oh perfect like he's just there all the stuff with me him and anna when he says things and he and i are going back and forth a lot of that was improvised Mm. I, we what about when her. he when he tells you his real name was that improvised too no that was a that was a written that scene. scripted yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so that that's was a great scene yeah that was a big one that was the one when i was like this dude's acting too but, <laughs> yeah. that, that was, um, but he's he's honestly so good in it and it reminds me of what i love so much about character actors and why honestly i'm a little bit mad at the sag deal because i don't think it repre it, it didn't honor the character actor as much as i wanted it to in terms of residuals mm -hmm. that class of actor that we all our generation all grew up watching on shows and movies and loving and being yeah. like if you love movies your favorite character is the freaking cashier man mm -hmm. yeah 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 in yeah. order for those people to like have a real life and have kids and a family and a job 
They need to be paid properly. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is those people are getting paid nothing and they're trying to get all their stuff in one day. And they're saying, well, like the leads who promote a movie matter and everybody else after that top tier are replaceable. And they're not because if Biff Whiff was like a medium talent, my movie sucks. And once Biff started crushing it, I'm like, you know, I now know that I'm going to like the movie because of honestly Biff's performance. Mm. like all this stuff with me and Anna when we would go I'm like I'm pitching her in the stories I need to get her on board so we're together and then Mm -hmm. I go what do you think and he's literally eating chips again he was not told to eat chips and (laughs) dude loves chips he's a hungry guy (laughs) and he goes like like what you can get well and I go I'm sorry man I couldn't hear you and he goes take what you can get I just couldn't understand a word he said I died at that moment that was so that level of commitment and honesty in something I'm like man that's the good stuff and if you have a bad character actor they're chewing to be funny and they're going like "Mm." and then I go what do you think and they go and you're like you're sweaty man shut up (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> just it's pretend so you're a real guy and just live in the moment. And then, you know, like even when we're walking up and we first see Anna and I go, there she is. And he goes, doesn't look so scary to me. Well, that was yeah. off camera. That's just what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, I'd be like, yeah, Biff, we're off camera. And he's like, well, she didn't look that scary to me. And I'm like, I mean, you're not wrong. We'll put some scary score behind it. But yeah, you're right. Anna Kendrick didn't look scary. <laughs> <laughs> you love him. Love him. So, Jake, this being your first featured film directing, right? So what's fascinating to me is I always find it fascinating how a filmmaker slates themselves in the credits. Like, you know, you have different filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino is like the ninth film by Quentin Tarantino or Scorsese's like a Martin Scorsese picture or whatever. Yours is a film by Jake Johnson. Um, and I just wonder, like, what say you have in that like, and emotionally what it feels like to see that on a screen Hmm. before your movie starts. Yeah, uh, that was really Joe Hardesty. So Joe Hardesty, a producer, he also did a movie, Ride the Eagle Together. He's a super talented guy. Uh, Honestly, I didn't really feel anything with that, if I'm honest. Hmm. Uh, Hmm. I didn't think about it a lot. Uh, I felt like there was already my name so much and my face to start it Hmm. that I wanted to try to combine credits because I was afraid of the uh, Tommy Wiseau from The Room, you know, written by, starring... Produced by <laughs> craft service by <laughs> the guy who gave a shirt to two extras and then chip like, supplier. Load. Yeah. Chip supplier. <laughs> Another thing we are like, uh, uh transportation you by you're like, get out of here. You're such a loser. <laughs> Dude, like you see it a little bit too much where you're like, Jesus man, spread the names out a little bit. It's embarrassing. Like, couldn't you get anybody else to do a job here, pal? <laughs> <laughs> but it had to be cool to see that on screen though. A film by with your name. Yeah, well, gotta be cool, I'll, I'll tell you, it was, it was cool. What was really cool was, um, honestly, the truth is because directing was never the dream or the passion, uh, being in movies and creating TV, that was the passion. Uh, it just felt like it was something as I was going, the workload had, was always so overwhelming. And a lot of it was where I didn't feel strong. And so a lot of it would be like at night watching YouTube videos and trying to catch up. And the moment it really hit me was we were at South by Southwest and we were about to premiere it. And we're at this gorgeous, huge theater and the whole staff is there and they're all waiting for me to give my technical okay on the sound quality of the theater. Oh, wow. Well, I'm probably 30% deaf. So I, I got old man ears since I've been, I've been that guy since I was 15 going like, I'm sorry, honey, I couldn't hear a word you said. So I'm listening and I'm thinking it looks and sounds pretty good to me. And then like, you know, our, you know, executive from MRC, who's really technical, she was like, let's do this. And our DP was going and our editor, everybody was helping. And I was like, kind of going. And then when the name came across, my brother, who's my best buddy, goes out loud. He goes, oh, and then he goes, pretty fucking cool, man. (laughs) And I went up and he was like, he's like, that's your name, man. That's you. And I had the first time of like, you're Mm. right, man. This is cool. That's but awesome. everything up until that, it was like, and then I was thinking like the speech before I have to make sure I thank everyone. I don't want to be disrespectful Then I got. So most of it for me was juggling a lot of balls. And as an actor, I know how to do that. 
I know how to go do press as an actor and something and make sure, even if I don't like it, how to represent it in a way that I, I don't feel like I kick it and I represent what I liked about it. I didn't know now that I've got more practice. I'm like, I don't know how you do it as the director. Mm. Mm. That's cool. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. That's yeah. cool. Uh, Jake, you know, I, you and I were just talking about, but I was texting Sean about this earlier today as well. I feel like there's so many brilliant scenes that you had to write two ways because they were, there are were sequences where things are happening to this guy. And as we're watching them, we're going, yeah, like this is, this is reality. This is what's happening. And then 30 seconds later, he has to explain to someone right. what just happened. Yeah. And when he explains what we just saw, what, what <laughs> seemed entirely plausible, when you say it out loud, you go, well, shit. Now, of course, no one yeah. believes him. That sounds so I'm sort of curious yeah. about the art of crafting a scene that within 30 seconds seems both logical and somehow crazy at the same time. Yeah, so everything was kind of built around the idea of the it was two scenes. The in terms of the tone, it was when Tommy first tells his family mm. that they all need to be together. I really thought of like if I was telling like my family, like my extended family, not my wife and my kids, but like, you know, my siblings and like mm. my uncles and aunts who like I haven't seen in a couple of years. And if I was sitting down and honestly telling them, they would all want to believe and I was like, I need to have parts in there where they go like, yeah, but that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so like the, and the intervention scene of like, it wasn't just, you couldn't just have like, I saw my dad who I haven't seen forever. And he says, hi, you could go like that could work. And it had to then go in a limo with Wayne Brady. <laughs> there needed to be the moment where you were allowed to be with Tommy because you saw it. Yeah. yeah. And then like, so you know, if you're watching a movie and the movie tells you it happened, it happened. And then you also, what I really thought comedically for me is then I also want to be on the other team. And I want to be with Daryl Johnson, the brother, where he goes like, because like you should be questioning. And so for me, it was just always can both sides work? And what we did with directing a lot um, on set a lot was the big discussions were, does this break the game either way? So like, mm. the, for example, when the ninjas pop up, when Tommy's sleeping and they're all in the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was there a cartwheel? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the versions, because we had a storyboard artist who helped us do it. One of the games was we just cheat and the camera's there and then somebody appears. And we talked about the idea of you can do in post. No one's there, then someone's there, right? Right. Okay. So, and we were like, we could do anything. You could have somebody come from the ceiling upside down and, and we were pitching these <laughs> ideas and all laughing. And it would have <laughs> been a huge laugh, right? Yeah. And you would have, yeah. when watching it, would have been spectacular, but it would have broke the reality because if they were going to do that, where's the wire? And then if right. they were going to do that and he looks up in the ceiling, where's the hole in the ceiling? Yeah. And so we tried to, and I'm sure that somebody will find holes in it, but we tried to make sure that you could find a way. And so that's why what they're doing in that scene, we put crazy score and we move the camera a lot. It's literally people popping up from behind chairs. <laughs> yeah, like out of the closet. Doing a car <laughs> <in> the closet. <laughs> so, so it's like, a, I like how quiet it is too. He's like, he doesn't, you don't even hear him. He's like. <laughs> exactly. Well, here's a, so here's what's funny about Eduardo Franco, who's such a killer. <laughs> And I didn't know him before this movie. Every take, he was saying something different at full volume in there that we had to mute out. So you would literally have to edit out crew members laughing where he would go like, let the kitties be released. And you'd be like, don't say that. Uh, because nobody quite knew the tone, you know? It was like we were in the middle of the night in Altadena and a bunch of people dressed in black are coming out from like behind curtains. But the, that whole idea of, you have to see it as because if you're Tommy, that's a nightmare. Right. If I'm in it, the, your nightmare in a room when you're in a hotel by yourself and you get a little spooked is there's 70 people in here and they're all going to murder me. <laughs> <laughs> this is my nightmare. No, so that had how, to be real. I love how cool you played it whenever someone was waking you up in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> you woke up and you were right back in the game. That's right. <laughs> you're like, you got to go down to the limousine. Do I really have to go right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That was so goddamn funny. Um, okay. I want to get to a place where we can ask you about the ending of the movie. Uh, I will. We will put this behind a spoiler yeah. warning, and I don't want to ruin the film for anybody. Yes. But Jake and I, Jake Hamilton and I, 
we're having an argument about the final shot in the film. Um, and okay. I'm not quite sure if we're still arguing over because legitimately for this entire run of this movie, I'm still questioning, you know, what's real and what isn't real. And I want your interpretation yeah. about whether Maddie is even real and whether it's like, can, is there an interpretation where Maddie isn't even an actual character because you choose not to show her at the end of the film? And I thought she was going to end up killing you. That's where I thought that was going. I, I thought so too. Like I thought I, yeah, I, I thought that was going to be. That yeah, was yeah. Be that, cool. yeah. Um, so here's what I will say about it is, and I know this is it's not a cop out to me, but it might seem like one. Um, I don't want to say my in total interpretation of the end because I think part of the fun of it is like when we first. So what I will say is we made a lot of changes after South by Southwest. Okay. Ooh. Mm. And we made a lot of changes uh, that, so we did South by Southwest, Hulu came in aggressive and bought it and they were very excited and everybody wanted to do the big, you know, celebration. You know, we, we went to the festival, we sold, we're happy. But then I ended up talking to a lot of people in the theater and not like, you know, just people in the business, but like random people. And then like random people on social media even would like send a photo and say like, you know, tag me in it. And I would write back, like, what did you think? Mm -hmm. And I, then we start, I asked if we could do another, like a uh, little screening, just like a quiet, nobody knows about it, but let's just sit. And I would sit with audiences after and talk to them. And in hearing the way people were taking to it, I realized I want to actually give more in that third act. And I mm -hmm. want to like make some changes. And so we begged and we got some money and we did some read like really quiet reshoots. We added some scenes, we retweaked some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the ending to me is the fun of it is that there is a choose your own adventure aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And there is a little bit when you start getting to the end of like, well, hold on. I wanted it to end more like this. And somebody goes, yeah, but I thought it was that. And you go, well, it's a 90 minute movie, man. You can have it both ways. <laughs> yeah. okay. Because I, I like and to be really cheesy, you know, and obviously I'm saying something we obviously know it's not a deep statement, but it's entertainment. So yeah. if you're like, yeah, but hold on. Like I did, it, I did a, uh, 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 Scott Ackerman's thing for the spider verse. And he was really mad that it was to be continued. And he was like, it shouldn't have been to be continued and blah, blah, blah. I'm funny, mad. Uh, and was I was that's like, Ke it, that's Kevin's take. Kevin. Also. Yes. And really, and my kind of thought was as we we're going then he goes like, what did you think? He's like, are you mad? I'm like, no, man. Like it's also entertainment. Even if you're a little bit, uh, disgruntled about a certain thing, we put things in the world of like, well, that means it's bad or it's good. <laughs> did you enjoy the game? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Are you going to come see the next one? Yeah. And are you going to talk about it a lot in between? Yeah. Like fun. Yeah. And so for me, the ending of it, the, you know, we did different sets of reshoots and changing of the endings. It was, uh, I like that you're thinking that Maddie was totally made up. That was not where I was at, but I will not mm. say now that's not a possibility and not could be the right answer because okay. I've heard that theory before and I like it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people said that they thought she was a killer. That's, I did not think that, but I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. But the idea that Maddie's going to open the door or never open the door. I'm like, th all that happens in terms of Tommy's growth, which is what I do know as a filmmaker and means a lot to me, mm -hmm. is at the beginning of the movie, when he got his heart broken, he didn't have the guts to knock on someone's door because he didn't want to feel what would feel if it was opened and rejected or opened and let back in and he had to make the changes. And he would rather get close and not do it. And after mm. this really crazy game where he's hunted and he survives and he goes through hell and back, he's not afraid to knock on that door. At all. So mm. now he's ready to face things. If he wins or loses, who the hell knows? But Can he I, had in his world a huge jump. I, I'd love incredible. to ask a really obnoxious follow-up question to, to Sean's you know, debate yes. about certain things in the ending. How much weight went into the very singular moment of Wayne Brady hugging your family because to me that was the moment because because even when he's sitting next to you you could still make the argument of a like ton. maybe it's still but the moment he hugs your sisters is where i went okay well then it has to be real yes. right like so he, a, that's a, what I, a, a ton of discussion went into that <laughs> we had we had versions where we had cut him out we had versions where wayne is not revealed we had versions of the ending where 
Uh, we do that same family scene, but he's not there. We oh, had versions, you know, but there was a mm. lot of versions of how the, how you could end this movie. There was a version that the movie ended in the in Lacey Warehouse where they go, you won. And I go, yeah. And it cuts mm. hard. Oh, mm. no kidding. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's I experimented cool. with a lot of different. End- so the original written version that I wanted to do years ago ended like that. Oh my God. Mm. And That's I wanted, wow. and I wanted that, that original ending was what do you, up to you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, and for me personally, I'm happy with that. Yeah. yeah. And I, and oh, for and, me yeah. personally, I'm like, great. Then as we had other things, cause we shot stuff, I would literally put it up and feel different stuff from audiences. And the reality with movies <laughs> is, especially with a movie like this, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but like, some people aren't going to like it because how it ends and some people are. And partly I feel, and maybe I'm a, just a Chicago prick. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah of course. <laughs> Do you know of that course. where I'm like, well, great, man. It's a $5 million movie. It's it, we're not making a $300 billion movie where we need to make a trillion and every quadrant needs to love it and bring all their kids. Good it's already in profit. Yeah, so man, it's just, it's like, I view movies more the way that I want to do things more is like, when I was in the 90s and there would be like a new album that came out. Like I remember when Trees Lounge came out with Steve Buscemi. Yeah, and yeah. I remember watching it and leaving it and going like, I don't know if I liked it or hated it. And I'm like, but I'm sure the hell glad I went and saw this. Yeah, mm, exactly. And so my movie, I feel like, is way more likable in terms of just the comedy of it. Comedy is way easier to come on board. A lot of this is meant for fun. So mm. I want this to be a movie that people enjoy. And if somebody goes, hey, that ending pissed me off and I feel this, my real thought is like, well, that's okay too, brother. That's your yeah. trip, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just yeah. like you're, as the great Lebowski says, that's just like your opinion, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> you're not yeah. wrong. You're just an yeah. asshole. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. And, you're just an and, asshole. And, <laughs> ambiguity to me is the best way to deal with cinema. I, and so I, I know we have to let you go. I, I want to get you out of here on this one because I, I find... I want to I know we talked a lot about how fun the film is, but I think the film also deals a lot with introvert, introverted and extroverted aspects of our lives. And I spent a lot of my early years being extremely extroverted, wanting to go out and be around people all the time. And the older I get, uh, I want to I I like spending time alone, going to movies alone sometimes, just chilling. And I, I found that interesting because your character basically gets pulled out of this introverted aspect that he's dealing with into this extroverted environment in a weird way. And I wanted to ask you about that on on a personal level, um, how you deal with that from an introverted and extroverted aspect of your life and being who you are and being a, a, an entertainer. But also, you know, I'm just wondering what battle you find in your own head with those themes. Well, I, I, I think you and I were similar when I was younger. I was always going out and I felt like uh, all the answers were out. So all the answers were going to be in the bar or be if you're a group of friends were going out and you weren't there, you were missing everything. And so the excitement of other and what other people had, I thought, was where the answers were. And then as I've gotten older, I'm like, it's actually the opposite. And so I have been, you know, I don't socialize too much. Obviously, I got kids and if it, so it changes. But you just get into your own routine and you really like your routine. And then when the pandemic hit and everybody was forced into isolation, uh, the what kind of probably what really pushed this was when uh, it first hit and I started doing these Peter Parker things where I would send voice notes out to uh, kids as Peter Parker. And it started off as like a little nothing kind of fun thing I did where I just posted something on social media like if your kids are spooked send an email here and I'll say as Peter Parker that like, it's going to be fine. And I truly, it was late at night and I was scared about the pandemic and my kids were young and asking questions that were getting spooky. And the amount of responses were probably over a hundred thousand in a day. And I needed to get UTA to help like distribute. But what really hit me was how sad a lot of the uh, emails were. And how scared everybody was and how it would be adults being like, hey, man, I know you said kids, but I'm 47. I live alone. I'm by myself. I'm terrified. I know I'm not an idiot. I know Peter Parker's not real. If you don't mind, could you say that like to Steve, it's going to be okay? Oh, my God. That's amazing. It it was amazing. And I thought like, yeah, like that's really cool. And it made me like it's one of the reasons why I love the franchise so much 
where you're like, oh, that's really neat. Like you're using a fictional thing to just help you get through a hard moment. And it doesn't matter if you're eight or 60, that's fucking awesome. And then I thought, man, how much I love random interactions with people. How like if I'm in a bit of a mood and I go to lunch and the waiter or the busboy says something funny, like, you know, years ago, the thing that I remember was I was sitting in a, my, the, the, the restaurant. I always go to an Atwater village and I was, I was doing the movie, no strings attached. And I was like studying the script by myself. And I was so nervous. It was Ivan Reitman. And the bus boy came and he and I had always did, we would do bits and chat and he'd go, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And I was like, oh, for a movie. And then he's like, what's your character? And I started explaining it to him as if I was going to be in Hamlet. And I was like <laughs> an unthinkably thoughtful actor that needed to know like all the details and the backstory of my character, Eli. And, you know. <laughs> and he goes, so basically your character is like, hey, man. You should like the girl. You should be with the girl. I like pizza. <laughs> and I started laughing and went like, you got it, my brother. Yeah. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it truly brought me like months of joy. The whole process when I'd be like, I'm going to forget my lines and Ivan Reitman's going to fire me. I'd go like, you should be with the girl. You like the girl? Get with the girl. I like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and when the pandemic happened and all that was taken from everybody, yeah. I thought like, I get, I could see a guy like Tommy who doesn't have that. And he's saying, I'm desperate for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't say to a random bus boy, you need to be with me. But I can say to my sisters and my mom, these fools are trying to kill me. Will you sit with me for a little, little bit? Yeah, man. And so- I saw a lot of this as like a, an interpretation of the pandemic of you have to be yes. close with each, with each other. If you're not near somebody, you know, and, and almost saying to the threat that's coming outside, like, no, I'm with someone. Yes. I'm with them. <laughs> They're on the toilet. Yeah. Get you can't interact. kill me. Don't kill me. We're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. threat is right outside of our window. But the problem is, and for me, the reason it's a pandemic movie for me is once I would start taking the pandemic so seriously and I'm wearing goggles and two masks, well, then a real legit friend of mine would be like, you know, it's just the flu, right? You goober. And I'd be like, no, well, no. And they're like, you know, this is really just, and they would have their version. And I would go like, why am I wearing two pair of goggles? And I'm like, what is the truth here? And so that was really the core of this. Like when I was like, that's where I'm going to find like what this movie's about. This was my pandemic movie. Wow. Damn. Uh Jake, you stayed on much longer with us than you had to. We really, yeah. really appreciate your time. Really um, fun chatting, guys. Yeah, obviously we're huge fans of the movie and yeah. are tremendous fans of you. And um, I and we hope all you get love to direct Spider something again Spider Verse soon. stuff, yeah. man. Uh, Continue doing I mean, that stuff, please. Yeah, please. I can please. tell over my shoulder, and I've got the Miles <laughs> yeah. phone. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Have you started recording anything for Beyond? Have you started doing any voice work for it? Nothing. Nothing. What? Nothing. No, it's, it's crazy. still it's coming out in March. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but, well, well, I will say I can't I can't say anything about that, but I will say with recording of actors, things can go fast. So my Sorry. not my not recording truly means nothing. Gotcha. Yeah. You but, know, right. if they if you find yeah. out the animators hadn't started animating, then that's a different thing. But yeah, there, yeah, there's problem. really no breaking news from an actor, for a voiceover actor, even if we try to break it. If they wanted to, like I did a, a movie uh uh, for Wild uh, Wildwood Studios, I might be saying that wrong. If I am, I feel embarrassed. But I only, I recorded my entire role in one day. Wow! 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 So okay. you never know. You never know. Yeah. Wow. And by the way, uh, we had Pem Daniel Pemberton on our show for the last Spider Verse. It was one of the most fascinating people we've ever. I, I've never heard someone break down music the way that dude does. Like, like, That's man, amazing. there's so many amazing people. That next level. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, really is. is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to tell everybody to see this. And again, Thanks, you're guys. welcome back anytime, Jake. We really appreciate having you on. Yeah. Fun talking. Thanks, guys. Jake. We want to thank our good friends at Hulu and, of course, Jake Johnson for joining us on the show. OK, we're going to talk about Self-Reliance, uh, a movie that we all really liked a lot. And, you know, we're going to get into some plot details. If you would like to 
you know, wait to listen to this and go and watch it. It's available on Hulu. We, we are huge fans of it and recommend checking it out. But in the meantime, we just want to get into a conversation about what works and what doesn't work, especially with Jake Johnson being a first time director. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really loved hearing his process. His process solidifies to me the down to earth feel of this movie. Yes. Um, it's a surreal process. And at times, Kevin, you were writing down that it reminded you of the game. I thought it also had a little bit of a Palm Springs angle to yeah. it, um, which is funny because Andy Samberg's in each of them in that it has a really clever premise and hook, but it doesn't use it to the extent of like big sci fi splashy stuff or just it's Jake Johnson's character. And this isn't giving you know too much of it away. This is the surface level elevator pitch. Um, he gets recruited for a game uh, where he essentially has to stay alive for 30 days. And he's told that people are going to be coming after him to kill him. And it's part of a the most popular game on the dark web. And you kind of go along with the premise as much as his character goes along with it. But as Jake Hamilton was mentioning in the interview, there are so many times when what we're watching plays out as normal in the movie that we're watching. But then Jake's character will turn around and explain it to different people. And you're like, well, that's just ludicrous. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But I think because he has such a good grip on what the tone of the movie is supposed to be, all of that works extremely well. Or it did for me. I, I found it to be really, really funny for those reasons. And sometimes when that's handled properly or, or improperly, that can take me out of a movie completely. Every time he did it, it just brought me more into the world that he was trying to build. I, I think that's that's sort of what works. And it is also too one of those movies that I think, and he touched on this, that uh, I think a lot of people's opinion is going to be determined by how you end up feeling about the ending. Um, because as you're watching the film, you are swaying back and forth as to, is this really happening to him? Or because you're given the context that he recently went through a really tough breakup and he's been having a lot of troubles uh, mentally and he's living with his mother. There is a part of you that also believes Maybe he's just having a mental breakdown and this is how he's dealing with it. And I mm -hmm. think that's a testament to his screenplay that there are moments where you go back and forth either way. It's not like Fight Club where you kind of have the rug pulled out from you at the end and then you go back and see things. I found that it's that sensation of Fight Club, but shifting every 90 seconds where you're mm -hmm. like, no, of course this is happening to him. Like clearly, look, look what, look what it is. And then he explains what we just saw to his mother, you know, uh, and you'll, you'll hear a line that, that Sean pointed out that I love, which is uh, an Ellen DeGeneres impersonator just beat me up 30 <laughs> seconds ago. That line made total sense. Yeah. But when he <laughs> says it out loud, you go, Oh no, he's having a mental breakdown. And I think it's just yeah. such a brilliant screenplay. And the fact that this is his first sort of full theatrical screenplay, I think says a lot, but to my point, I also do think that I, I think the ending is a little bit more definitive than Jake Johnson thinks it is. I think okay. because of one shot in particular that I, I pointed out in the interview, that to me that answers the question. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it's less ambiguous than, than maybe other people might think it is, than I think even Jake thinks it is. Um, and I think I would have liked a little bit more ambiguity. I would have liked maybe to, to not know. Um, or to be left feeling like it could go either way. Uh, I do feel, I, I have a hard time convincing myself that it's not one way in particular because of one very specific shot. Okay. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, this is an interesting film for me because I, I when, when it comes to interviews that we do for our show, sometimes I'll have to watch these films within my work day on my computer, which is not ideal. Um, and I say it's just that how without, the, to, to get these interviews done. Sometimes in yeah. your defense, Kevin, sometimes we have no choice. Sometimes it's a matter of we watch them at our work desk or we don't watch them at all. 100%. And that's what I'm saying. It's like, like at the, at the end of the day, my ideal situation would be to go to a theater to see uh, X, Y, Z sure. or watch it in my home with the best sound and picture that I could possibly get. Um, and this was a film that I didn't know anything about going in. I just, I knew I like Jake Johnson and the way Sean describes it, the less, you know, the better. Um, even if you just know the log or the tagline of it, which is this, you know, a guy's offered a million dollars to play a game and you know, everyone's trying to kill him unless he's by, unless he's with somebody, if he's by himself, 
he can die. That sounds intriguing in itself. Um, but what I loved about my experience watching this film is I'm trying, I'm watching this movie in between my live shows and I'm in the middle of with edits with my editors and I'm going in between and I couldn't wait to get back to my desk to see where it was going. Cause it was so it was, like you guys said, it was like changing so much of the time and all I kept thinking, cause Jake said something on the show last week, uh, something about like, you know, the whole movie kind of, boils down to the last five minutes. And I was like, in that, that, because, that poses. So then that was in my mind the whole time watching it in a good way. And I was like, oh, I wonder what he's talking about. And then I started understanding, like, oh, this is where Jake's going. And then, then I'm watching it and I couldn't, I couldn't stop watching it. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I, I needed, like I would, I would push myself an extra minute or two before I had to be in studio to finish a clip in, in, or a scene in the movie because I was so into it. Um, as I sit here and talk about it now, I would I do like the film a lot. I think it's actually a really solid directorial debut from a feature perspective. Um, it will make my top 10 list. Probably not. But it, I was highly entertained by right it. now. It's um, my number one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, actually, my number one, I guess, technically is Godzilla minus one. I guess the first movie I saw this year, but I guess it's 2023. Um, but in terms of filmmaking, like Anna Kendrick's great. As you heard in the interview, the cast is fantastic. And Sean brings up an interesting point about process. I like how aware Jake was, Johnson was about um, about his level of directing. Like at the end of the day, like it, it takes a really good, confident artist to say, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Let me just hire good people around me so that they can, you know, it's not it's not it's not like you're passing things off or being lazy. You're just the one of the big things about directing that people tend to forget is hiring the best people to pull off your craft. Like not everybody is going to be Nolan or Tarantino where they're really into the film stock and the lens choices and the cameras. Right. I mean, I don't even know if Jake even knows all the lenses and the things. I mean, just that within this used. podcast, we have right. different sort right. of sensibilities about filmmaking. Correct. Sure. It's like we're all we're yeah. all it's yeah, if you were if you were it's that'd be actually a really funny real blend segment or a real fun. Which director we all, we all would be. Yeah, let us know in the comments. Like if if you were to put a director <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> if, if you were to put a director a on oh, no. our and then yeah. I don't know if uh, we have a lot of people That's out there who do we play. I'm really we worried would, about that. that. We would be. Um, Kevin is going to have to run right now. He's got to catch back up with live television. Jake and I will finish out the show. Um, Jake, I just want to mention how much I just like Jake Johnson as a personality, yeah. like an on-screen personality, sure. even too. I've loved him in New Girl. Uh, I love him whenever he shows up in supporting parts. I love that he ex has accepted and and even seems to really appreciate the character actor role, uh, not needing to be the leading guy. You know, he stands out in his scenes in something like Jurassic World, mm -hmm. but then is very easily able to also step in and carry a movie like this and hold his own, you know, opposite Anna Kendrick um, and the the amazing, amazing uh, Biff Whiff, who yeah. I can't say enough good things about. I know him from um, uh, maybe you should leave. I think he played yeah. Santa Claus on yeah. Maybe You Should Leave, um, and it's terrific in this film. Well, you know, to your point, and, and this isn't meant to be like in a you know because we had a, such a phenomenal interview with him. But right before we did the Real Blend interview with him, um, because he's from Chicago, I did a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, interview for television with him, and he told me two different stories that I think perfectly exemplify what it is you're talking about, Sean. Um, it is uh, February 4th is the 10 year anniversary of what I believe is one of the most singular funny moments in the history of television, which is the scene on New Girl where his character and Zoe Deschanel meet Prince. And if okay. you've never seen that moment, uh, the, it's, it's his character and Zoe Deschanel's character and Prince walks up and they freeze and Prince takes a moment and goes, oh, I'm sorry you may now freak out and it's how they each <laughs> freak out in that moment. Yeah. And he talked about uh, being allowed to just geek out with Prince. He said, he was telling me while they were shooting that, that like they have a, a three shot of them on a bench. And in between takes, he said, you know, we all kind of thought that Prince was going to rush back to his trailer and then come back. He said, Prince just hung out on the bench. And so he said, Zoe and I looked at each other and went like, Oh, so we're just, we're just going to sit on this bench with Prince. And he yeah. said that he just told stories with them the entire time. And he was oh talking God. about that in contrast, because this is about like knowing when you can geek out with someone, because the reason I brought this up with him uh, was about an incredible moment he has in the film with Christopher Lloyd, who yeah. he's just a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I was talking to him and said, you know, when, when you're the director and you're the boss and, and not just the boss, you're also his only other actor to act off of in that scene. 
To mm-hmm. what degree do you need to be professional? And to what degree can you go kind of go, hey, remember Back to the Future? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talked about in those moments, he said, you know, he said, listen, he goes, we only had Christopher Lloyd for one day. One okay. day. And he goes, we shot that scene in the back of a car from midnight to five. And he said, I wanted, as he, as he mentioned on our show, he said, I don't like pickups. He goes, I want to shoot a scene all the way through. He said, so mm-hmm. Christopher Lloyd, who not, respectfully is an older actor, would have to do Dude. these 10, 15 minute long takes and then basically reset and do it all over again. And he okay. said, that was the moment where he had to realize as much as I would love to ask about Marty McFly and the hoverboard and Doc yeah. and all these sort of things, that ain't the time. That's the time to be a professional. That's the time yeah. to, to recognize, oh, I am, you know, as, as we all get older and realize, oh, we are the adults in the room. You know, oftentimes yeah, yeah. There's so, I'm almost 36. There's so many moments I look around for the adults in the room and realize it's me. And I feel like yeah. that's sort of the equivalent <laughs> of like recognizing, oh, I'm the filmmaker on set. It's not time right. to, to ask about Adam's family. So I think you were talking about, you know, him being also a good guy and a filmmaker. I think having that moment where he recognized, oh, now's the time to geek out with, with Prince versus, mm-hmm. Oh, now's the, not the time to, to geek out with Christopher Lloyd, I think is a perfect example of how much he has grown as a professional, but also just realizes he's a Midwestern guy. When to bug someone, when to not. Yeah, yeah. No, very true. All right. So self-reliance is available. That was a really now. long way of saying, I agree with you, Sean. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. That's okay. We had to fill some time. You did good job. Good job, Jake. Uh, go see Self Reliance, or actually go find Self Reliance. It is available on Hulu. Uh, I hope Jake Johnson gets to make more films. Uh, he's he's so pragmatic and he's so realistic. Of like, I have to try a bunch of genres now because I don't know if I'll get to do this again. And that's the sad reality of the business. Mm-hmm. In that, you know, if you're not a, a big name director, how many shots are you going to get at the uh, how many bites of the apple, right? Yeah. But so, also, like, uh, I I want him to want to make more. Like, he seems like one yeah. of those guys that kind of just does things. Like, he has a wife, he has kids. He kind of seems like he just does things when he wants to. So it's less of like, oh, I hope he gets to. I hope he wants to do something else someday. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I really liked what he did here. Um, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. We want to thank you guys brand for tuning into episode. this one. Obviously, we're working our way towards episode number 300. Oh, there's a call to action. Uh, we wanted to mention the fact that uh, Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be hitting Apple TV this weekend. So uh, in your streaming pursuits while you are heading over to watch Self-Reliance, uh, you might want to go watch Killers of the Flower Moon. So let us know uh, with Flowers of the Moon opening. Did you go see it in theaters or did you specifically wait to watch Killers of the Flower Moon at home? Maybe knowing its length, maybe not wanting to go to the uh, theaters as much as you used to. For whatever reason, did you go out and see this in the movie theaters or did you wait to see it at home? And are you now happy that you will get a chance to see it? Head to the comments of the YouTube uh, channel here and let us know your answers to that. In the meantime, follow all of us on social media. We are at Jake's Takes, at Kev McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. And the show itself is at Real Blend. I forgot Sean, what our call out is going to be. You started to tease. Before we get to, you started to say we're working towards a big milestone. Oh, episode, episode number 300. We, we, we're not going to say more than there's a big milestone coming up. We always have hashtag if it happens coming. True. This we is true. Some, but, you know. There's this is this is we're 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 talking about very thin things at this point because we're we're a bit away and we're working on it in the background. But I know what they are. They do happen. It's pretty exciting. I just wanted to throw that out there for the people that stick around. Wow, Gabe, you're not big on teases like that. Well, tempting Vixen. If it it falls through, (laughs) you know, we'll just start the episode and say, "Hey, look at that." Uh, here's a game or something. I don't know. I like that. I like that you <laughs> left this for the people who stay till the very, very yeah, end. Yeah, just trying to true, whittle down that. This is the, uh, the completion the equivalent yeah. of the, the Marvel <laughs> post credit scene. Yeah. It is. And just like a Marvel post credit scene, there's a good chance it ends up meaning nothing. <laughs> yes, this is the Charlize <laughs> Theron. Of yeah. This is the Harry son. Styles. Of, and Harry uh, Styles <laughs> as <laughs> episode 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Dunkirk. I don't know. No, Dunes. Dunes. Some, some, Dunes. some bullshit. I don't know. Dunes. Dunes, Dunes. Dunes with a dollar sign. Dunes. 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 <laughs>